Hello, this is Kyle, also known as Alien Tude, and today I have a review of this Siamese Edge Burmese Da, or Dob. Now, I bought this sword from Siamese Edge in July of 2022, and the price was about 19,000 baht, which translated at the time to approximately 520 US dollars, and that included shipping to me. One of the reasons I bought it then is that they were offering a limited time deal to if you ordered one of their custom DA, you would get a custom trainer from Freel that was kind of designed to mimic your DA. And I thought that was a great deal, so I jumped on it. And I received the sword and the trainer about four months later. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about the trainer as it's not something I'm gonna end up using a whole lot, but it is a pretty nice uh, synthetic trainer. It's got relatively similar dimensions here it's not exact, but it's pretty close. It is about three ounces lighter and balanced about a little bit more than half an inch closer to the hilt than the actual DA, but that's not too far off. I do from time to time pick this up if I want to move something sword-like around inside the house because it's relatively short. You know, I have wooden arming sword, a wooden long sword, but they're just frankly too big it within the house to really move them around at all. This one is short enough that I can at least simulate uh, small bits of sword activity without going outside. So let's talk about Siamese Edge for a moment. They are a company based out of Thailand and I am reasonably confident that they do their sword making with completely traditional methods. I'm sure they use modern steels. In fact, this one is a pretty modern steel from what I remember. I don't remember the exact specification, but I will put it up on screen here. But I'm reasonably confident that they are actually hammering it out, forging it and all that. And then they probably use some kind of power tool to grind it to shape, you know, angle grinders, belt sanders, who knows what. But I am, like I said, reasonably confident they are actually forging these swords. Siamese Edge offers three different tiers of swords on their website. They have their kind of entry level, beginner level of swords, which range in around the $350 to $400 price range, and they don't really offer any customizations on them. However, these are the models that they have in stock most of the time. So if you want something quick, that's where you would want to go. They also offer custom Da or Dob, and these can range in price up to right around what I paid, 520. I think you could get a few more uh, customizations to make it a little bit more expensive, but I got pretty close to all the customizations, the, the extra cost that brought this sword to that price range. I think the custom ones start around 425, 450, somewhere around there. They have a lot of customizations available from different grips to uh, whether or not you want uh, the homone acid etched, if you want this uh, tr traditional etching, carving, not sure exactly what uh, the method that was done with. You can specify the blade length, the grip length, the target weight for the DAW. They have a variety of different tips and like the belly of the blade. There's quite a few options there and they leave it up to you for the most part what you want. There's again also like different color cord wraps. The scabbards have a few different options and different rope colors, a whole lot of options. So it's not quite to the level of like say a custom katana, but it's pretty well uh, fleshed out. Now the wait time for one of these custom DA is around four to six months. They do seem to take the orders in batches, however, so that they won't get overloaded. I saw a post by them on Facebook recently that they had two order spots left for January of next year, right around there. So they are keeping their production runs relatively low to make sure that they keep, don't get a backlog. It, it, that's what it sounds like to me, at least. Their other tier of swords is their signature series, which are replicas of existing historical DA. Now these are rarely in stock, and I'm not even gonna list a price range because they have one in stock right now. I think it was around 
seven, eight hundred dollars. I don't remember off the top of my head. I can put a screenshot of that web page up. Actually, I can't because it looks like it sold since recording. But these are going to be longer production time and they rarely have them in stock. So the one that's on in stock right now is not a common thing. Now I am not at all an expert on Da and their history, but I'll talk about what I have gathered in my uh, rather limited research online. So like is so often the case when we refer to a sword from another culture in their language, the word Da means sword. This is very similar to say Kilich or Shamshir, uh, Spadona, all sorts of words in different languages that we use to identify them as a type of sword really just mean sword. Now, da can also be referred to as a dab or a darb. And from what I can tell, the difference there would mostly be cultural. Da would typically be uh, Burmese, dab would be Taiwanese, and darb would be Laotian. In terms of what makes a da a da, you generally will have a cylindrical grip, a single-edged sword, uh, something that has a belly to the blade that kind of flares out here. This one is pretty gentle in the flaring out, but it is there. I've certainly seen other da that have a much wider belly. There is oftentimes decoration on here, and there's pretty much never going to be a cross guard or a knuckle bow, anything like that. The blade is generally gonna be curved. Some of them have more curve than others. In fact, I think I recall seeing some that are nearly straight. There might even be some that were completely straight. There's, this is not hard and fast rules here. Generally speaking, there these kind of etchings on here, uh, the more high status the sword was, the more likely they would have something like that. It could be etching, it could be inlay, it could be kaftgari. There's a, a variety of things. The more high status, the more decorative you would get, and the hilt could certainly get a lot more decorative than this one. Now, as for the scabbards, they were going to be wood core, oftentimes with metal bands around them, some of them clad completely in metal, oftentimes very highly decorated as well. The suspension for the scabbards would be cord or rattan, and unlike a lot of swords, they, the, the way you wear the suspension is you kind of loop it over your head and shoulder and kind of wear it like a baldric, except whereas a baldric, it's st the sword still ends up near your waist. With a da, you kind of end it up a little bit below your armpit, which is a really comfortable way to wear it. And for more on that, and also to get the impressions of somebody who has a lot more experience with historical DAW, I encourage you to check out Matt Easton's review of one of Siamese Edge DAWs, which I'll link, link up below and in the description. And he's got, uh, he has at least one historical DAW. He's got handled uh, considerably more than I have because I've handled absolutely none. So if you want that more expert opinion, I highly recommend that video. So speaking of scabbards, let's take a look at this one. So this is a wood core scabbard and it starts cylindrical here and then kind of uh, gently transitions into a much more elliptical shape, which is from what I understand very traditional for uh, Burmese Da. The purple rope here is quite thick and tied in this kind of presentation knot that kind of reminds me of how katana are oftentimes delivered. There's a uh, brown, dark brown lacquer across all of the scabbard and in, that includes across all these different copper fittings. There's quite a thick layer of lacquer on them and it, it really does help with the transitions here because it's they're pretty smooth where they do kind of stick up a little bit in a few places it's not a sharp transition so I don't feel anywhere that's really going to catch very much. Maybe right here could catch a little bit, but not, not very bad. The copper fittings also, they're definitely epoxied on in a few different places I can see the epoxy, but I think there's actually grooves cut into the scabbard, into the wood part of the scabbard to have them sit in there because just the way they, they hug the scabbard, it feels to me like they are actually kind of inlaid into the scabbard a little bit. Now these are, like I said, copper, and there's a decent amount of detail here with some raised parts, and all of them have this kind of wire in different places. And I think this is actual wire, not cast 
to look like wire because the texture is very crisp and a little uneven and there's parts where you can see like the wire looks like it's tucked under itself. So I think that's actual wire on each of these fittings. If we look at this uh, shape here, you can see four different pins. These are what looks like brass and they're going to be inserted into the wood core to give extra security of how this is held on. The fit of the blade to the scabbard is pretty good. There's very little rattle. If I shake it like this, I can feel a little, but I don't hear any. Like this, there's a little, and I can get a little bit of rattle out of it, but not very much. If I hold it upside down and shake, it doesn't come out at all, and takes very little effort to draw, and it's a very smooth fit. If you look here, when I'm pulling it out and in, you can see that this copper ferrule here is actually what tensions the sword to the scabbard. And when I pull it out, it actually kind of lowers a little bit. And then I have to raise it up to fit it in there. And it get, gets in there with a nice little snug snap. It really shows that it fits well. And if we look at the mouth of the scabbard here, you can see it's pretty chunky wood there. It's pretty thick. The opening is pretty small and it fits to the blade very well. One thing that is just complete, pretty much non sequitur, when this sword came, it came smelling very strongly of choji oil, and the scabbard has retained that smell for around a year or so that I've owned it. I smell it like that. It just has that wonderful choji oil smell. And it's just a, it's a nice thing to notice. So let's take a look at the hilt here. Now this is a very minimalistic hilt with wood core, cord wrap uh, that is uh, kind of a blue. It's darkened a little bit in the time I've owned it. Then there's a copper ferrule and a copper butt cap. Very minimalistic. Now the grip is cylindrical and normally that's a big no-no for sword reproductions because it really makes edge alignment tricky. However, for a da, that is traditional. So it would be a no-no to not make it cylindrical. Now when I use this, what I notice is with the first cut, I generally don't have a lot of problems with edge alignment because I'm controlling that cut more. It's when I do a second follow-up cut, that's where I start noticing a little bit of difficulty indexing the blade. It's not something I can truly criticize the blade for because it's true to how they were made, but it's something to be aware of if you want one of these that you know, indexing the blade, getting good edge alignment can be trickier because the grip is not giving you any inherent feedback as to where the edge is. Now the ferrule and butt cap, like I mentioned during the scabbard, are also lacquered like the copper fittings on the scabbard. And it's a pretty heavy lacquer that gives these kind of a weathered, not really weathered, a rustic look is a good way to put it. And I happen to really like it on both these and on the scabbard. I think it works really well. And aside from the cord darkening a little bit just from me handling it, right near the uh, butt cap and at the ferrule, you can see where the lacquer kind of slopped over a little bit. This is, again, part of the rustic look that I think Siamese Edge is going for, and it fits with the whole appearance of the sword. The shaping here is actually really good also. The little, little uh, attention to detail, all of the transitions from the cord wrap to these fittings is very smooth, very even. The cord wrap has a little bit of a rough texture to it, which is really good for keeping the blade, for, for keeping the sword in the hand. It gives me a good grip on it. Like I can't really crank on it to show that grip, but I feel like I have a good solid grip here. If we look here at the butt cap, you can see it has, like the shape, a little pin that's holding it into the uh, to the grip. I'm sure there's some epoxy here also, and this pin looks like it's brass. Now, when I first got this, I thought this was actually a really small pin, but it's not. And it actually is good that it's not because, again, that's not traditional for Da. Historically, Da were not peened. They didn't have uh, pins through the grip and the tang. They pretty much were epoxied or glued into the handle. And I can show that that's the case. If I take a magnet here, I can feel some magnetism here. And as I'm going, it's getting weaker and weaker as the tangs gain smaller. And then right around here, I don't feel any metal, any magnet, any reaction to the magnet here. And another way to show that, 
fine. Don't know if you're gonna catch this on sound, but let me try. If we tap here. It, it sounds different as I'm moving up here to the point where up here, it doesn't sound like there's anything. Uh, it, it, it sounds like it's solid wood here, whereas down here, it sounds like it's a multiple material. So I'm pretty, I'm 99% confident the tang ends right around in here and then the rest of this is going to be solid wood. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. So this is a relatively short blade at 24 inches long and pretty robust at 6.2 millimeters thick at the start. It tapers in thickness quickly at first and then slows down into an even taper throughout most of the blade ending at 2.5 millimeters, two inches from the tip. It starts at just barely over one inch wide, tapers in a little bit, and then flares back out, creating a wider belly for cutting. It is balanced at just under five and a half inches. Now there's quite a bit of aesthetics on this sword that are not the standard for one of their blades. You, it, It's extra cost to add them and make the sword more distinctive. The first one I'll talk about is these kind of carvings or etchings in the blade. I, I opted for them because to me, that screams DAW. Uh, not all DAW have them, but I figured if I was gonna be spending around $500, I'll add a little bit to get them in there. Now, again, I'm not sure exactly how they are put in there, but they look like they're done by hand to me because there's little variations in the, the lines, the depths vary a little bit. They've all got a nicely hand done look without looking amateurish, if you will. They're really nicely done. I like the way they look quite a bit. Uh, the other most obvious aesthetic feature of the sword is the very prominent hamon. Now, that does mean the sword is differentially hardened, so it's gonna have a harder edge and a softer spine. And all of their swords, I believe, are differentially hardened. This one, the Hamon is brought out a lot more because I opted for their acid etch on it, which is designed to make the Hamon a lot more prominent, and it certainly succeeded. Now, that acid etching, it kind of did an interesting thing in that the entire blade kind of has this washed out acid wash look to it that is a little rustic, a little refined. So I'm kind of calling it a refined rustic look and I think it looks really good. It really works for this sword. As you're looking at the close-ups that I'm showing you, you are almost certainly going to notice a couple very, very small chips in the edge. And those came from when I was cutting. I'm not positive what caused it, but I am probably about 95% sure it was when I cut into a two liter soda bottle and I cut through the cap. I wasn't aiming for the cap. It was my bad that I cut into it. But the thing is, the, the plastic caps on those bottles are actually quite thick plastic and pretty hard. And it's not unusual for them to chip a sword. It's small enough on this sword that I think a few minutes at most with a file would clean them up and you would barely even notice that anything had been done there because they are very, very small. But it is something that happened and I should point it out. There's a few subtle geometries to the sword that may not come across in video or photos very well. So I'm gonna talk about them here. The spine is not flat. It's uh, peaked a little bit. It's kind of got a central ridge, much like a katana does. When I look down the length of the sword, if I'm looking just at the spine, I can see the, the ridge does waver around a little bit, but not a lot. Similarly, I can see that the planes of the blade have a very slight waver to them here and there, but this is very, very minor. And when I look down the planes of the blade, I barely see any rippling. There's a little bit here and there, but for the most part, this is actually a very well-finished sword in that regard, which kind of surprised me. You know, when I think of a more rustic sword, I think of a little bit less time taken to smooth that kind of thing out. This is a refined rustic is how I'm defining it. And they took the time to make this a very smooth and evenly finished sword that you can tell that they put a lot of time and care into the crafting of this blade. 
and that shows in the edge beveling as well. It, there's no micro bevel, no secondary bevel, and it has some apple seeding to it. And if I'm just feeling from the spine towards the edge, right about where, right about here, about midway in the blade, maybe a little bit past midway, there's a, a not distinct change in geometry, but the edge starts curving in into the final edge. It's a very refined apple seed. It's not a robust apple seed. It, this is not a robust edge. It's a pretty refined edge, but there is some care taken to making that uh, a little bit more one geometry rather than having distinct changes in geometry. I'm going to test the edge with some paper cutting. Real quick, what I expect to do is draw the sword through from the edge and it should bite into the paper and slice cleanly through. Failing that, I then will insert the sword via the tip and draw it through. A sword, in my opinion, should be sharp enough to bite into the paper. Some production swords fail to do that. So if that's when I do the insert test. If it fails there and tears or kind of just doesn't cut at all, it just means to me that the sword is not, not sharp enough. Now this one does have those tiny chips to it. I kind of rather expect it to start tearing when it hits those chips. But let's see what happens. So it did struggle there to bite into the paper. I want to try it a couple times because sometimes it can be tricky to get it just right. So there, it, I started a little further back than I probably should, but then it bit in and sliced very cleanly right until it hit those chips. Let me try again with another piece. And this time I'm going to start up more towards where you would actually cut with it. Much, much better there. I think the edge is a little more refined up here. And again, as soon as it hit those chips, it stopped cutting and started tearing, which is pretty much exactly what I would expect. That time it didn't bite in at all, it just tore. I think that was mostly my just not having the edge aligned properly. So yeah, it's very clean and very smooth cutting once it bites in. It struggles to bite in in a few places over in this area, but once it does, it, bite, it slices through beautifully right up until it hits those chips. So for cutting, I did not yet have a chance to do tatami with it, but I did cut water bottles and pool noodles. And to cut a long story short, this sword is a light target dream sword for cutting. It is so much fun to move around. It is so light, nimble, and yet it still has authority in the cut. I On pool noodles, I was able to get most of my cuts very clean, very even. With how light and nimble it is, I was able to do multiple continuous cuts. It was, it handled pool noodles with aplomb. And it's notable that the pool noodles were after it took the slight chips in the edge. So if those were affecting it at all, I didn't notice it. So speaking of those chips, this is the cut where I think it happened. You can see that I cut right through the thick plastic cap and it cut it, it handled the cut very well. The bottle stayed in place. I got several more cuts on that bottle. But the thing is, those plastic caps are quite thick, quite hard, and they tend to have the ability to chip a sword. It's not gonna have happen every time, but it does happen from time to time. So if you don't want that to happen, which I certainly don't, you generally wanna to try to avoid cutting into those caps. Unfortunately for me, I missed my target. I meant to cut more into the neck. I cut the cap. It took a little bit of damage. I consider that more my fault than the swords. Some people may think that that's unacceptable for the sword. The thing is, swords are not indestructible. Historically or modern swords, it doesn't matter. They, If you cut with a sword enough times, eventually it's going to diminish. Whether that be chips, rolls, just dulling, no matter what it is, Cutting a sword uses it, and it does, to put it in video game terms, swords have durability and they will need to be repaired. <laughs> so, you know, if this was a historical sword and it took a few chips like that, the owner would just take a file or whatever, fix the edge very quickly, and put the sword right back into use. It's absolutely normal for small amounts of damage 
after X amount of cutting, <laughs> there's no way of saying exactly how much, but it is normal. It's a shame that it took that damage because it slightly mars the sword a little bit that I would love to have it in pristine condition, but I can't hold it against the sword. And even after taking those chips, this sword was just an amazingly fun cutter. I get a lot of good, clean, smooth cuts, silent cuts. It handles water bottles, milk jugs, all those targets with ease and is just so much fun to cut with. Like I said, I haven't done tatami yet with it. I don't know if I'll be able to, but if so, I will certainly post a video because I think this sword would actually handle tatami very, very well. Let's talk about handling now. So this sword weighs in at only one pound, two and a half ounces, uh, around 525 grams. That is incredibly light for a sword of any size, in my opinion. One, two-handed, pretty much anything. Very light. And it is incredibly lively because of that. You know, um, with the grip length, it's usable one or two hands. In one or two hands, I believe, generally speaking, Da would have been used one-handed. And then you could probably shift the grip to, you know, like extend your reach or add a little bit more cutting power. But it's also very usable in two hands. And just incredibly light, incredibly nimble. And that's despite the point of balance being, you know, that looks like right around five inches, maybe a bit further. And it's just, it's so nimble, even with that point of balance being out there. And you know, that point of balance is out there because this is a lightweight hilt. There's almost no counterbalance on it, but it's also just a delicate, not a delicate blade, a uh, slender blade, uh, just not heavyweight blade. And that just makes this incredibly easy to move around, can redirect motion very well, tip control, very good tip control, even with that point of balance out there. It's just so easy to move and control where it's going. Now, with the round grip, you know, I mentioned before, I do have some problems with edge alignment, more on the second cut. You know, this first cut, I generally have decent, not perfect, of course, I'm nowhere near perfect with swords, but the first cut is generally not too bad because you're setting up for it. But then when you adjust, it t I tend to not have quite the right edge alignment. Uh, a little bit worse than if I do it on other swords uh, where the grip gives me a little bit more feedback on where the edge is. It's not a criticism of the sword really because it's true to historic originals. It's just a fact of life when you're dealing with this type of sword. In terms of blade presence, there is some out here, but not a lot, which to me is kind of surprising with, generally speaking, when you have a point of balance this far from the hilt, you, you end up with more blade presence here. Not the case here. This has what I would consider to be the perfect amount, enough to feel it kind of guide you through the cut without the tip dragging the, the cut through. I don't feel like the tip is pulling me at all. I feel like the blade is per pretty much perfectly guiding me through the cut, which that, that's a good feature to have in my opinion. It does aid in the overall cutting performance. And you know, when I'm holding it up here, when I'm choked up on it, that's pretty much how it feels. If I start moving my hand around, if I move it down here, I definitely have more blade presence now because I'm changing the lever points, right? It definitely starts to feel a little bit more tip heavy. This still feels pretty good. But if I move it down here, now I'm starting to feel that tip really pulling me, pulling the sword through the cut. It still doesn't feel tip heavy. I still feel like I have pretty good tip control, but it definitely has more power in the cut. And being able to adjust your grip like that is going to be very useful for the type of cut you want to do and even for thrusting. Like if I want to do this, but I want to get extend my thrust, I can slide my hand down or I can, uh, if I want a le little bit more tip control, I can slide my hand up. Now with this very pretty much non-existent guard, thrusting is not going to be a great idea because I could easily see my hand slipping 
and end up grabbing the blade. I don't want to do that. So I think thrusting on soft targets is not going to be a big problem, but anything that has any kind of resistance to it where the sword's going to could potentially get stuck or jar, I could easily see my hand sliding up and grabbing the blade and end up cutting myself pretty badly. In terms of comparisons to this DAW, I have here the LKHN Royal Arsenal Hondao, which I chose this as a, a comparison because it's fairly similar in weight at one pound, one ounce, uh, and about five, 490 grams. Relatively similar blade lengths, widths, Overall look, the biggest difference is the, the this uh, DAW has about a double the length grip. Let me put down the DAW for a moment. So this sword here has a actually a very similar feel. It I have a it's a very different style of grip though because it's much more rectangular. It aids in edge alignment much more than the DAW does. However, you don't have the versatility of changing your grip location. And this one has pretty much the same exact style of non-existent guard where I wouldn't really want to stab against uh, anything with much resistance to it. But this is, again, this is a, an even lighter than the DAW, just an incredibly light sword, very nimble. And it feels actually has a lot of the same feel in terms of blade presence as this DAW. The DAW feels like it has a bit more weight right here, maybe a bit less weight out here. Let me see what the point of balance here is on the Hondao. That looks like it's about the same, maybe a little further out, but it does feel just a tiny bit heavier here, a tiny bit lighter here. We're talking very minor differences. What I really do like about this DAW though is you can choose to use it two-handed. You could even start a cut, follow up with the second cut with the second hand. It gives you, a, it's a little bit more versatile of a weapon from what I see. The other comparison I'm going to do is to the Ronin Katana Dojo Pro Number no. 10, which is a Co-Katana. If we look here, again, relatively similar blade lengths, widths, that kind of thing. The Ronin Katana actually has a longer grip. And I chose this one because it is kind of a short blade for a two-handed grip, something that could be used one or two-handed, a lot like the DAW. Let me put this down for a moment. Now, the thing is, the this Dojo Pro is considerably heavier. It is two pounds, three, four ounces, right around there. So pretty much more, over a pound heavier than the DAW. So it's really not going to feel anything remotely like what the DAW does, but I figured this would be a good comparison because this is a model that is readily available. It's something that you could get very easily and have an idea of what the DAW doesn't feel like. So this is, the, the entire thing feels heavier. It, it, you pick it up, you immediately do feel that one pound weight. But in terms of the overall balance, it doesn't feel that much different. Let me see what the point of balance is. So this is actually, interestingly enough, this is only like about a two to two and a half inch point of balance. So it has what should be more maneuverability, more agility, but that extra weight and honestly the even longer hilt gives it a little bit less agility in my opinion. It has around the same tip control and a, the same I won't say blade presence, but around the same tip weight. This has a lot more blade presence though, because it is a heftier blade. You know, this is not a delicate sword. This is not a thin or, you know, lightweight sword. It is not, you know, katana generally aren't, spe generally speaking, are not particularly light and nimble. They're not clunky, generally speaking, but they are, they are hefty blades, especially for their length. And since this is even shorter, without sacrificing a ton of weight from a normal katana, this is, you can feel that authority in the cut here. But it is usable one-handed. I will say the extra grip length does start to interfere with moving it around a little bit. Let me pick up the DA. Yeah, I picked this up. This feels like nothing in my hand compared to that katana. It is so light, so quick. 
you know, you can do double cuts so quickly and easily with this sword because there's just, there's not a ton of inertia to have to change, you know, if you're doing something like this and then a follow-up like that, there's not a ton of inertia you need to, to change there. You don't have to really even use your body to stop the cut. You can just move it around so easily, so quick and light and nimble and agile. It's honestly shocking how agile this is. Now, I imagine you could get Dom that are bigger, beefier, and end up being more cleaver-like, especially if you get something that, it, that flares out more. Here, there are definitely tips of Da that are much broader out here. I imagine those are gonna be even more cutting effective than this and probably more tip heavy, even though they probably get quite thin out there. Bottom line, this sword cost me approximately $520. Was it worth that price? Well, if you're familiar with my reviews, you'll probably notice that I skipped right over potential improvements. And that's because I really couldn't think of much to put there. The, about the only thing that I could think of is that some people will probably be turned off by the refined rustic look as I defined it, as I described it. And I could see some people not liking that. So maybe Siamese Edge could offer uh, additional upcharge to give it a more refined look. Just a suggestion. I don't know. I don't mind this look at all. I think it looks great. So just a maybe. I don't even know if that would be something that would be valuable to them. So the fact that that's the only thing that I can really think of to improve this sword should tell you, yeah, I absolutely think it's worth my money. This is a fantastic sword. I love owning it. It's one of my favorite swords just to pick up and move around because it's so light and nimble. It's such a good cutter. It's the light target cutter's dream in my opinion. It just handles it so very well. Now, there are historical da uh, available for less than the cost of one of these. So there are some people who will say, why buy a reproduction when you can get an actual historic da? Well, for me and other people, I presume, one of the primary reasons, probably the primary reason, is to be able to do cutting. For me personally, I don't want to take an antique and cut with it because you're diminishing the sword. So you're diminishing history. And that doesn't sit right with me. No judgment if you want to cut with your antique. Just for me, I don't want to do that. So I think reproductions are perfect for that. And there's not a lot of reproduction da out there that I can see, at least none that have any real degree of history of historical accuracy. So if you're in the market for a reproduction da, Siamese Edge seems to be an outstanding option. I can tell they put a lot of attention and care into the crafting of this sword, and it really does show. And with that, let's wrap up this review. Thanks for watching. Make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, all the things YouTube wants you to do to show that you enjoyed the video and that the channel continues to grow. Until next time, Alien 2 out.